Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart. Let's talk about this game. I've been playing it for the past week, received a copy from Sony for review purposes from PlayStation. I beat the campaign, which took about 17 hours with 98% completion, according to my save file. I did pretty much every optional quest. I got most collectibles. There were like a few gold bolts that I didn't collect, and I haven't fully maxed out some weapon upgrades. But that aside, I pretty much did most of the game's activities. And depending on how much time you take with this game, I'd say we're generally looking at a 15 to 20 hour experience for a first playthrough if you do all the side activities, and likely closer to 10 to 12 hours if you beeline straight through the campaign. I also did try out a bit of a new game plus mode called Challenge Mode, which makes enemies tougher and allows you to essentially unlock a new tier of weapon upgrades. And so if you're a completionist, you're probably gonna end up doing a second playthrough. And one more thing you should know is that I played a significant portion of the game in fidelity mode because performance mode was not available when we first started reviewing the game and then a patch dropped mid-review that added performance and performance RT mode. So a lot of the footage you're gonna see is fidelity, but I did play the game in performance RT as well and recorded some footage of that that I'd like to show you. So I'll give my impressions on how that difference was like. So with all that out of the way, what did I think of the game? I think the best way to describe it, just in a short summary, is that it's this joyful, thrilling, at times heartwarming, but most importantly, fun, intergalactic amusement park is how I would describe it. I mean, some segments might as well straight up just be a roller coaster ride. Every visually stunning planet you visit and every new bombastic and creative set piece you encounter feels like its own ride, each taking you from one spectacle to the next. Now, I did encounter some notable technical issues, which I'll get to, but overall this game was a blast and it's also the first game that I really felt showcases what a big deal PS5's solid state drive implementation is and the kinds of cool things developers can achieve when fully utilized. Veterans of the series will feel right at home in Rift Apart, as the mechanics are an evolution from past entries. At its core, it is still very much that same style of action-adventure platformer game, with a bigger emphasis on action but a decent amount of platforming, that will arm you with an arsenal of unique weapons to play around with. That's probably one of the things I love most about this game, is just the huge variety of weapons and how unique and how good each feel. You've got your typical archetypes like your standard melee attacks, your pistol, shotgun, machine gun, sniper rifle, explosive grenades, rocket launchers, you name it. But alongside those, you've got things like a weapon that shoots out this giant beam, a grenade that summons a sprinkler that will cover your enemies and plant life and paralyze them for a bit, other grenades that summon other creatures to fight alongside you, a weapon called Ricochet that will send a projectile that will float around and smack enemies a couple times, a weapon that freezes enemies and uh, encases them in hovering ice cubes, and more. Every single one of these weapons is upgradable through a resource called Raritarium, which you'll find in the form of blue crystals scattered throughout the map or by completing activities and defeating certain enemies, allowing you to enhance these weapons' damage, their unique effects, max ammo, and other facets. And every single one of these weapons will be fully accessible mid-combat through a combination of deep pad shortcuts that are customizable and a weapon wheel with multiple pages that's also customizable. The one issue that I did encounter was that deep pad shortcuts weren't always responsive. Sometimes I'd try to switch to another weapon mid-battle and instead would end up wasting ammo on the weapon I already had equipped because the D-pad input didn't register. It always felt like I had to mash D-pad shortcuts a few times for the input to register consistently, so that got in the way of combat flow at times, but using the weapon wheel worked consistently well, which is great. Also neat is that each weapon really does feel different thanks to the DualSense's haptic feedback, which will vibrate with the appropriate intensity and frequency for the patterns of any specific weapon. Adaptive triggers will also offer resistances and vibrations for even greater depth and sensation, and this is all on top of all the various sensations you'll feel based on what's happening in the environment. Like one time I was approaching this club that was blasting bassy music, and I could feel the controller vibrate like how your chest vibrates and real-life clubs, and it got more or less intense as I got closer or further from it, 
which I thought was really cool, and that's just one example. Adaptive triggers are also used somewhat similarly to Returnal, where the right trigger will have two stages, half press to aim and full press to fire, though you can choose to aim with the left trigger as well, if that's more your preference. Some weapons even fire differently depending on whether you hold down the trigger halfway or all the way. The pistol, for example, will shoot continuous single projectiles at half press, and there's resistance there to more easily do a half press, and continuous triple projectiles will be shot if you full press the button. I did find that the adaptive triggers didn't always kick in properly though, especially while switching between weapons. There were times when resistance wouldn't be there when it should be, and it wasn't always easy to not accidentally full press the trigger instead of half press, especially in the middle of chaotic combat. Though fortunately, there aren't many reasons to use the half press function, as full pressing tends to be the more powerful option, but some occasional inconsistencies with multi-stage adaptive trigger presses did discourage me from utilizing the half presses more. Not the biggest deal in the world, but something I noticed. But yeah, there are tons of weapons in this game, and as you start to build up your arsenal and upgrade it, combat just gets wilder and wilder, especially once you start efficiently combining all of your different tools. Combat in this game is just incredibly fun and satisfying and gets more fun as more things are unlocked and upgraded. You really feel like you have all of the exaggerated swagger of an interdimensional Lombax. The game also does a good job of scaling the quantity and variety of enemies as well as the scale of certain encounters and the epicness of certain boss battles so that these aspects will increase as you progress through the campaign, and that keeps combat engaging as progression continues to turn you into a more powerful, a more dynamic one-man army. Especially in later stages of the game, you'll see tons of enemies thrown at you, and as you deploy and make use of your vast arsenal, particle effects will be flying everywhere, you'll be juggling between all kinds of things happening on screen, and beyond combat feeling good, combat scenarios can be quite the spectacle to behold, especially those set-piece moments. Veterans of the series will also have some new stuff to look forward to. Aside from new weapons and tools, you'll also have access to gadgets that will grant new maneuvers like the ability to dash and phase out of existence for a brief second, basically a dash and dodge button. You'll have the ability to wall run, you'll eventually unlock what are called hover boots that will allow you to dash around mid-combat for enhanced mobility and traverse the game's various planets and their larger than past entries open worlds more expediently. Traversal is overall an area where this latest entry has made great strides. Aside from the stuff that I mentioned, new mobility options include rift tethers that will allow you to pull yourself into these portals that will teleport you to that location. Though the visual effect in Rift Apart isn't that you're pulling yourself to the space, but rather that the space is being pulled towards you, which is a really cool effect that I believe is achieved using the SSD capabilities. And there are numerous sections and set pieces of the game where you can switch immediately between worlds and dimensions, essentially instantly teleport on a scale that I've simply never seen before. This is where Rift Apart takes full advantage of PS5's SSD and it's used to astounding effect at times. This game really shows what is meant by new game design paradigms that cannot be achieved without such an SSD implementation. Some of these sequences and set pieces where you're constantly switching between entirely different environments, I mean, it's truly jaw-dropping and it's the kind of stuff that really feels like it can only be done when you build a game from the ground up with PS5's architecture in mind. The one form of navigation that I didn't enjoy as much was flight, which to me felt a bit too clunky and tanky to control. Collision in particular can feel out of whack, it's very easy to crash into something then collision goes a bit crazy, then you're knocked off the dragon and you're taken to the last checkpoint, and it got a bit annoying here and there. Not entirely unmanageable or anything, not unplayable, just some of my least favorite gameplay, even as cool as it was to actually be able to take flight and traverse this sandbox in the open air. Fortunately, this flight mechanic is only confined to specific portions of the game and specific worlds and isn't super prominent. Beyond major set pieces fully utilizing PS5's SSD architecture, there are smaller things in the game that do that too, like these things called pocket dimensions that you can find as you're exploring the various planets. 
They're basically portals to these bite-sized mini challenge areas that you can seamlessly go back and forth between and after completion, you'll earn new armor. There are even some portals in certain planets that will instantly teleport you from one location to another, and unsurprisingly, there are practically zero loading times in Rift Apart, or they're so short that they're practically unnoticeable. Beyond new mechanics and visual spectacles enabled by PS5's SSD capabilities that make the world a joy to traverse through, there is a decent amount of additional stuff to do in the game's sandbox worlds. For example, each planet tends to have a side mission that will take you off the beaten path. Some of them will involve separate bite-sized adventures. Others will involve fetch quests in the form of collectibles. Some will offer challenges like the battle arena that will focus on offering combat challenges. And speaking of collectibles, there's a good amount of those, and the game finds the right balance of those being nice distractions while not being super tedious to look for, especially since the game is generous about disclosing their locations on the map, and the rewards for these collectibles tend to be decently worthwhile. Gold bolts will unlock some new skins, new features for photo mode and the game's gallery, as well as cosmetic cheats like big head mode or RPG mode that shows numbers when you deal damage, among other things. Spy bots will offer narrated lore and information on the planets that you have explored, so on and so forth. And as previously mentioned, some collectibles or challenges will yield armor, with each set coming with their own helmet, chest piece, and boots. Armor isn't essential in this game, but each set specializes in some useful stat boosts for things like damage dealt, damage taken, the amount of currency or resource you collect, XP gain, etc. Armor will also change the appearance of your Lombax and can even be cosmetically customized with different shaders that you can toggle between at any time. At no additional charge, mind you, no microtransactions in this game, all cosmetics are earned, which is how you do it. Now, gameplay in this game extends beyond the Lombax. The game will occasionally mix things up with many challenges that you can partake in as other characters. For example, every once in a while, you'll play as just Clank and solve these puzzles in dimensional anomalies, the goal being to use these spheres that manipulate properties of the world to guide your possibilities to a gate at the end. You will also sometimes get to play as this character Character Glitch, a nano spider bot that can traverse through the floors, walls, and ceilings of circuitry, with the goal being to eliminate the infestation of viruses. I'd hardly say that these were my favorite gameplay bits, but they're brief and sporadic enough that they didn't hamper the pacing or anything. The Glitch spider bot segments in particular I found to be a bit too disorienting because of some of the camera work and the constant shifts in perspective and gravity, and a few times I did actually find myself feeling slightly nauseous, not severely so, but just a bit of that discomfort. The clank puzzles were kinda neat, but I'd say a bit too simple, never offered an engaging amount of challenge. I just feel like they could've pushed it a bit more, but the idea itself is still interesting, and it served as something to add a bit of gameplay variety. Now, world navigation isn't just fun because gameplay is over overall very fun, the visual eye candy is an added plus, with the game often looking jaw-dropping. I'm not allowed to show you some of the game's planets because of spoilers, but honestly, I wouldn't want to spoil some of this stuff, I'd want you to see some of this stuff for the first time. At almost any point in the game, you can hop onto your ship, pick a planet you have unlocked, and tackle available main and side missions. Some planets will be ratchet-specific, others will be rivet-specific, and I'll get to rivet a bit later, but both characters share progression and mechanically behave identically. Gameplay-wise, they're essentially the same character with different skins, though they obviously have distinct dialogue, diverging yet parallel narrative paths, and so on. But you're not making any compromises by switching back and forth between them, everything carries over. But back to the environments, they truly are gorgeous. One of the first planets you visit is this cyberpunk world, and seeing how busy both the skies and the grounds are, how much care was placed in the surrounding architecture, how puddles of street water and other reflective surfaces reflect the environment with great usage of ray tracing, how the lighting that's also enhanced by ray tracing was fine-tuned to create just the right mood and delineate vibrant sections of the city from the seedy ones, I just couldn't help but stop, look around, and bask a number of times. The same goes for other environments, more nature-based settings, and just other worlds that I can't and would rather not show you. Just rest assured that one department where Rift Apart isn't lacking is environmental majesty and environmental variety. What really brings these settings to life, though, is the amount of care put on the details of NPCs inhabiting these worlds. 
In other games, you'll notice that NPCs will often repeat very canned and stock-looking animations, but in Rift Apart, even though you cannot interact with every NPC, they all look like they've got a story to share. They all look like they have a purpose within the world. And while animations will repeat, because all of these NPCs feel like they have relatively unique animations, it just really sells the world to me. Combine that with the fidelity in their animations and at times the density of NPCs in some planets and areas, and the result is worlds that feel like they could actually be places somewhere out there. Animation really does deserve special commendation, as this game without question features some of the best animation work I've seen in a game. There are so many nuances amidst the exaggerated features of this particular visual style that make these characters feel as alive and colorful as what you'd find in modern Pixar movies, especially during cutscenes, which are all rendered in real time, I might add, making transitions from cutscene to gameplay and vice versa look practically seamless. The added graphical prowess of the PS5 also means everything just looks better than ever with models, textures, fur is a big one for this game, lighting, environments, particle effects, you name it, being the best the series has seen and some of the best I've seen in any game period, elevated by the cohesion of the visuals and the incredible imagination behind the myriad artistic choices and designs. It also helps that the game's performance from what I experienced was rock solid for both fidelity and performance RT mode, even in some of the most visually demanding scenarios, be it set piece moments or during combat when all kinds of particle effects and enemy models were flying around and about in one giant colorful shitstorm. If there were any frame rate dips, they were so minute, brief and or infrequent that I hardly noticed or were entirely inconsequential. As for the differences between fidelity and performance RT mode, visually speaking, I personally didn't notice much of a difference in visual fidelity at a glance, and that was me playing on a 120 inch projector screen. I'm not a graphics analyst, mind you, I'm not saying there isn't a difference. Performance RT mode will upscale to 4K, whereas fidelity maintains higher resolutions, and no doubt certain effects will subtly look sharper or better in fidelity mode, but I feel like for most, the differences will feel negligible. Though there was a period of time when I first updated the game with the mid-review patch that unlocked performance RT mode, where the game did look more pixelated, like it was lacking some post-processing effects, but then I returned to the game later and that more pixelated look was gone. And at that point, from a pure visual fidelity standpoint, performance RT mode looked very close to fidelity mode, but with the added advantage of that smooth 60 FPS. So I don't know what that was about, but I'm glad it corrected itself. And let me tell you, for me at least, Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart at 60 frames per second is the way to play, especially with how heavy and frenetic the action can get with how combat heavy this game is. The game is more than playable at 30 FPS, don't get me wrong, but I personally found that the game looks and feels so much better because of that 60 FPS smoothness. But the wonderful thing is that regardless of your preferences, Insomniac is giving players the choice, which is always nice. Regardless of which performance mode you choose, sound design and music will always remain consistently awesome, with effects that accentuate macro details like environments, as well as micro details like moment-to-moment -moment combat. The different weapons all have such a different feeling in large part because of the excellent sound design, and interactions in this game across the board are elevated by just really on-point sound design. But the stuff that looks and sounds best, of course, you'll find in the very entertaining main campaign, which not only delivers on fun gameplay and visual spectacle, but also on a respectable action-adventure story with lovable characters who I came to care for. You are Ratchet and Clank, the beloved dynamic duo who are celebrated as heroes after all of their past endeavors and adventures. 
But celebration goes awry when the evil Dr. Nefarious spoils everything by stealing a dimension-shifting device called the Dimensionator from Clank in an attempt to find a dimension where he is victorious as a conqueror. And amidst ensuing chaos, the device is damaged, creating rifts that risk destabilizing the multiverse. To stop Nefarious' plans and reverse the ensuing dimensional collapse, Ratchet and Clank follow Nefarious and embark on a journey to this alternate dimension with characters separated and reunited at different points along the way. Full disclosure, I'm not a Ratchet and Clank veteran. I haven't played every single game. I've only played a portion of the PS4 Ratchet and Clank remake, and that's about all of the context that I have. But even for a newcomer, the story wasn't hard to follow. You understand the stakes, you understand the dynamics between characters, and while there is likely some history and references that went over my head, I didn't have a hard time following the main sequence of events. The surface level plot is pretty straightforward. There are good guys, there are bad guys, and you've got to stop the bad guys from doing bad things that threaten the multiverse. But where the narrative is elevated for me was in the game's exploration of its protagonists, who are more than just cute and funny animated creatures. Don't get me wrong, the endearing banter and comedic bits are definitely there, the dialogue overall I felt was cleverly and well written, and the game managed to get quite a few smiles and hearty laughs out of me with some of the character exchanges, gags, and personalities, but what made me care about these characters was that the game wasn't afraid to show their flaws and vulnerable side, with some moments and scenes genuinely tugging at my heartstrings. A big theme of this story is insecurity, self-doubt, and reservations on one's self-worth, with a spotlight being shined on characters who focus too much on their flaws rather than their strengths. A new twist to this entry, though, is the introduction of a brand new character, Rivet, the female Lombax who quickly captivated the internet when she was introduced. I've got to say, I love Rivet. She's a fantastic character. Her design is spot on. She's an equal measures, endearing, charming, and badass. Has great chemistry with the rest of the cast. Has her own vulnerabilities and flaws she's wrestling with. Just a great addition all around and a great way to mix things up a bit. And across the board, the entire core cast of performers brought the right amount of energy to these animated characters while knowing when to tug it back during those more emotional, heartwarming, or heartfelt scenes. There's also plenty to love about the supporting cast of characters who are also wonderfully performed with their own charming and quirky attributes, and Ratchet and Clank fans in particular will really get a kick out of seeing familiar characters' dimensional counterparts. Now, going back to Rivet, she isn't just some side character, mind you. She is as much a protagonist as Ratchet and Clank. Hell, she can at times feel like more of a protagonist than the titular duo. This game might as well be called Ratchet, Clank, and Rivet. And I personally didn't mind that Rivet had such a spotlight, though overall I'd say the protagonists do get about equal screen time. So I've praised this game quite a bit so far. Obviously, I really enjoyed it, but that doesn't mean that I didn't encounter a few issues that did get in the way. There were two major bugs in particular that hampered my ability to complete certain side quests. One of them was a side mission where I had to fend off waves of enemies, but enemies weren't spawning properly, so I had to restart from the last checkpoint, and I had to do this a number of times and do some finagling before I managed to get things to progress and work, but even then, enemies were getting stuck and not spawning as they should, and so it just kind of ruined that entire sequence. Another instance involved having to find the remaining items for a collectibles quest, only to discover that the last one wasn't labeled on the map. So I had to look all over this sandbox area for signs of this small purple plant, and it took me a while to find it and finish the side mission. Beyond that, I experienced some minor issues like a few objects not having the proper collision, random invisible objects in the middle of the map, enemy AI not responding a few times. Beyond that, one time I saw the legs of one of the larger enemies in this game, the animations of the legs spazzing out, and then separately from that, there was one part towards the end of the game where I looked at the preview video of a weapon I wanted to buy, but the game would stay stuck with button commands no longer responding, which forced me to restart. Now, it's worth noting that the developers are aware of some of these issues and have warned reviewers before they got their copies that they might stumble upon X, Y, and Z bugs with the day one patch intended to fix a lot of this stuff. The review embargo document specifically did mention the side mission where the waves of enemies weren't spawning properly. It mentioned that that was one of the issues that they were trying to fix with the patch, and it also mentioned some collision issues that the day one patch also hopes to resolve. Now, the day one patch did drop 
mid-review, but by then I had moved way past those points where I encountered those bugs, so I wasn't able to go back and check if those issues were entirely resolved or had been entirely fixed. What I can say is that the map marker bug for the collectible, where the map marker didn't show up for the last one, and the shop leaving me stuck did happen post-patch. So I cannot be exactly sure which bugs that I experience you may or may not encounter. I don't know if starting a new game after the patch drops will help mitigate some of this stuff, but it's worth keeping in mind that I did encounter these and at least be prepared for the possibility you might as well, though fingers crossed that the day one patch and hotfixes will ultimately take care of all this stuff. So unfortunately, there were a few snags and hitches that did disrupt the experience a bit, but barring those very specific instances and barring some of the qualms I had with certain aspects of gameplay, overall, I would recommend this game to PS5 owners, especially if you're into these kinds of lighthearted action-adventure platformers. I think many of you will be amazed by some of the things that this game accomplished as a PS5 exclusive, fully utilizing that hardware. I think many of you will be blown away by some of the campaign set pieces. I think many of you will find the game's visuals, animations, and overall presentation, sound design, music, performances really striking. I think many of you will definitely have a lot of fun with the game's combat and its sizable arsenal of unique weapons and substantial upgrades alongside some of the platforming, puzzles, and challenges that are scattered along the way. Completionists and fans of collectibles will certainly find plenty to love here, and I think many of you will overall dig the story, and especially I think many of you will dig the characters. And one last thing worth addressing is that the game is $70, so if you're looking for a 40 to 100 hour long campaign experience to justify that price point, that's not what you'll get here, but the 10 to 20 hours or so that you'll spend with this game for a first playthrough and maybe a potential second one are a high quality 10 to 20 hours and absolutely worth checking out at least someday. For some, for those who can afford it, I'd recommend checking it out as soon as you can. Whether the price tag is justified, of course, will differ from one person to another depending on your financial situation and your own subjective opinions on what gives a game its worth. But with all said and done, I think Insomniac did a stellar job with this game and once again showed why they're among the more beloved studios in our modern times and this is, I think, the best showcase of what you can accomplish with PS5 when you build a game strictly for this console. Some of the visual and gameplay spectacle in this game that utilizes the SSD implementation really does look and feel spectacular and at times magical. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is my review of Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart. I hope you found this video informative. If you enjoy this review, like, comment, share, subscribe, all of the usual stuff. Check out the merch store at yongya.com. You'll find shirts like this, among other products. And I hope you have a good time with this game, as much fun with it as I did. Let me know in the comments below if you're looking forward to this game, if you plan on getting it. And after you've played it, maybe come back, leave a comment on your experiences. So share your thoughts in the comments, and to be further updated on all things gaming news, reviews, and discussions, stay tuned right here on Young Yeah. I'll see you guys next time. Young out.